Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to define land, Los Angeles Nomadic Division, a little bit more in saying that what we're interested in is working with contemporary artists to, to create projects in the public realm, that is to say, in the real world, um, so that we might think about how we experience our actual existence and in relationship to art and to the way that it works and reflects on what we do and how we see. Uh, so hence the topic, the title of my talk, Other Ways of Seeing. Um, I'll start by saying my former life at the Whitney, I had the incredible opportunity to run our, uh, our off-site space, which was actually a free public area in Midtown Manhattan, where we curated contemporary projects with uh, contemporary artists. And this was pretty much the source of the idea I think is worth spreading, which is that when you work with um, an audience that isn't deliberately going to see that, now granted, of course, some of our audience did do so, um, but that the huge majority of the people who saw the work that was in this space, Midtown, encountered it accidentally, so to speak, or as part of their daily life, whether it be in their commute to Grand Central, to work, taking a lunch break, whatever it might be. But it was not something uh, planned in advance, not something deliberate, and thus had a, it, it sounds like a small thing, but it's actually the critical factor, I think, of a, a public art that can really speak to your experience, what you're doing, your way of life, your day-to-day -day context, and looking at it somewhat differently. This is also true, actually, for the artists who work in the public realm. One of the, while, of course, um, the museum itself is an amazing space, and I respect that hugely, I also think that for artists to think beyond the physical object of what they're doing and think about where they are putting their work and how that might affect and change what they're doing um, gives an opportunity that is really unique to that experience. In other words, that they might be able to think about the time that an audience member, a viewer, might be in which they might be experiencing it, the way in which they're encountering it, what they're taking away, what they're thinking of in other ways as well, and the, and the site itself. Now, let me show you a little bit of what I mean by that so it doesn't sound so abstract. This is the artist Gonzalo Lubrija. He's a, a Guadalajara-based uh, artist who created a series of films that were based in, in California, actually, all iconic California landscapes in which the artist was running away from the camera uh, towards, you know, towards the landscape that this was being filmed in. For the public version of it, uh, the, th the three landscapes were, for those of you who are familiar with California, were Death Valley, Joshua Tree National Park, and uh, Yosemite National Park. So natural landscapes, again, and creating this very poetic idea um, about absence and distance. The title of the piece is The Distance Between You and Me. So sort of the, the emptiness in between that kind of idea of communication. When thinking about the public, he thought, what is the iconic landscape in Los Angeles? Um, in this case, an urban landscape, not a natural landscape, um, Sunset Boulevard, being one that, of course, living there you know very well, but also maybe means even more to, uh, as, an, as an iconic idea of Los Angeles, the Sunset Strip, um, being like Times Square in New York, a very dense conglomeration of people, of things, of advertisements, of lights, of activity, of excitement. And um, so this is where we, he proposed to place the piece. Um, what we came up with was something that reflected, we hope, on the way people actually experience Sunset Boulevard. So, Again, this idea of context and encounter and interactivity was critical to the formation of the idea of a public work. You can see at the bottom of this image uh, the map, just to give you a sense of how we placed the pieces. There were three, as I mentioned, films. Two of them were placed on one, one mile away from the third. Uh, the commute is pretty straightforward. Almost everybody who does it does the entire strip, but it's a very slow one. Uh, the films were placed on moving image billboards, videotrons, they call them, um, that are normally used for advertisements, so that's obviously trying to give you a product, sell you something in an immediate, quick way. The idea behind putting these films there, of course, was to do exactly the opposite of that, something somewhat uh, obscure, somewhat not 
clear in its obvious message, uh, but something that could actually bring to light a different way of experiencing that commute. Now, to, for, for, the, for thinking about public work, you might come, things that might come to mind might be a very monumental sculpture or something that you see in a plaza and so on and so forth, which again, of course, is one way to go. But what I think is most interesting about experiencing art in the real world is the idea of discovery, the idea of time, insertion, interactivity, and duration. And so here, it may be that almost nobody might notice that there were these two elements in different spaces, but maybe one commuter, one person, who drives that strip every day back and forth from work and back, may have looked up and noticed that that didn't look like a normal advertisement. That wasn't what they see normally there. And didn't they see that just a mile back? And perhaps this notion of um, changing the way that you see things, it inserts a different way of looking at your contacts, at your life, um, will be a way to then think about art somewhat differently. We, of course, there are many other layers to it. Um, we loved the idea of it being the distance between you and me, and then literally putting that into the world, the distance between A and B. And your movement through the city may be creating some more visibility to how you exist in the world. I think seeing is very different than looking, and that's something that um, we're hoping to, you know, we feel that uh, uh, projects like this actually bring into the world. So. It also ended up that, um, so this is an example, this is what it looked like on one of the sites, uh, just so you can get a sense of how you'd be moving past it. As an aside, a quick aside, um, one of the great things about working in the public sphere is that you never know how things are gonna change. And what we had thought was going to be a one time an hour presentation ended up being nine times an hour because there weren't as many advertisements at that time, economically speaking. Um, and uh, so that allowed us to change the sense of the project that practically everyone who went along that strip was going to see one or both of these films. And so that was a really exciting element that impossible to predict and one of the most interesting aspects of working in the, in the variability of the public realm. Just give you another view of it. And lastly, in, in the sense of the public returning to the artist, uh, he, he incorporated this landscape into the next piece of work that he did. In other words, this is a performance, a performative activity, um, whereby he actually ran down Sunset Boulevard. This is what you see in, in the image behind me. Um, and, and that became the next step of the work. Um, another example of this idea of interactivity and the ways in which audience can activate um, a public work in a different way than seeing it in an institution uh, it was a project that we did at the Geffen Contemporary at MoCA, Museum of Contemporary Art, in Los Angeles, obviously a venerable institution, an amazing place, but it was done in the public area by an artist named Morris from Mexico City. Um, I'm going to skip to this because it's the pertinent vision there. Um, actually, unfortunately, his, once we invited him to come, his visa application was actually denied. So that became the content of the work. Uh, the idea being about inclusion and exclusion initially now had this a whole new real life meaning because it, it, it prevented him from doing what he wanted to do but um, like many artists he just pulled that into what he was thinking about and how he could communicate that to the public. You see here the, um, the rejection letter screened on the loading docks of the museum door. Loading docks for museums is usually where the art comes in so a bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of uh, uh, reference to that idea of the art that's accepted and this is that, that had been denied. Um, in the doorway of the institution, the actual transition between you on the outside and you on the inside were what appeared to be white uh, sheets of paper that as you walked on them, uh, these images, these faces emerged that you can see in the top left and the bottom right is, is the, are the images um, blank, so you can see how the transition would happen. They basically, it took the time, that again, this idea of time and duration and your participation and interaction into the work to actually make it happen, create that world. The images were um, uh, portraits of people who had moved to the United States from Mexico, but illegally, but had made their lives in the US and had actually, you know, their community, their family, and then been deported. So in a sense, erased from that existence. And what he was trying to do is then bring that back to visibility in this very loaded 
kind of space of authorization, of legitimization, and so on. Um, the title of the work was uh, Mikasa e Sukasa, so obviously a little bit of a pointed job to that notion. Interactivity can also mean a very direct and an immediate community-based way of participating in an artwork and understanding it and thinking about it in terms of your life. This is a project by the artist Lisa N. Auerbach. Um, what you see here are people creating a pattern, a knitting pattern, as it were, um, out of the people that they want to exercise from their lives. So again, this idea of thinking about your particular individual existence and applying it, investing it into the work. Uh, what you were, were asked, and also kind of fun too, so. Um, what you were asked to do here was to put the name of the person you wanted out of your life and why. Um, so it required a certain amount of honesty and directness, which, you know, more often than not, we don't get to do. The notion of communication and kind of transparency of humanness is also an element that we want, that we feel is really critical to um, interacting with the public. So here you see the people, as, as the evening wore on, people got more and more comfortable with uh, putting down the people that they wanted out of their life. So the pattern ended up having to become two patterns and ultimately will be knitted into a large banner quilt, sort of, so to speak, um, uh, as, as the final piece. So becoming actually a part of the work is also a critical factor. This is um, an example of what I think of, it, it actually brings a lot of the ideas together in one. Um, the difference between public art as monumentality and public art as discovery, uh, intimacy, integration into your world. Uh, what you see here is uh, the Flagler Memorial Island in Miami. It was, it's actually a man-made island um, designed to memorialize one of the founders of the city. Um, you can see the particularly male monument in the middle there. And um, it was very constructed initially and has since then kind of gone to seed, so to speak, gone, returning to its, it, what would be its natural state. So uh, it, it was initially a very manicured, precise, uh, national Park. It belongs to the city and is open to all of the citizens or anybody who wants to come. It's open to the public. Um, to, and it's used very, very regularly by uh, the communities around there. The only way to access it is by boat. Um, and they do very often to, you know, bring their kids and go swimming and have barbecues and so on and so forth. So the opportunity to do something on the island that presented itself um, to really do almost the opposite of what it was intended to be and take advantage of what it really was, what it was really being used for. And uh, this is just a, a map to show you how you get there. It's not very far off, you can see it from almost anywhere, but again, only accessible if you have the initiative to, of discovery and, and idea to go and look for those things that might be there. Um, what we decided to do was bring 18 artists in as, uh, to create projects specific to that space integrated into the island itself and allow the viewer to find them, to discover them um, with these maps. So almost like a treasure hunt or, um, you know, riffing off so many things in terms of uh, the island of lost treasure or treasure maps that we all grew up with in our children's literature. And then hopefully also thinking a bit about this idea of nature versus quote unquote civilization from which you came and can see back and forth. So actually being able to visualize a lot of the ideas that are inherent to the work that happened on the island. Um, I just want to show you a couple of the images. They were, all of these were performative artworks. There was video um, and then sculptural uh, installations like these, like the skeletons that were washed up on shore were actually an artwork. Um, the artists participate to a degree where it's more important to them that the public, that the audience has a way to experience and really directly interact with the work than it is to protect it or preserve it or treat it like something that's not a part of our lives and our humanness. Um, some of the uh, installations were hidden into, uh, you know, coves and so on, and then some were um, even more directly interactive, like uh, the bottom right, which. Uh, is intended to reflect like muscles in the sand, so to speak, and each of those records, which is what they actually are, were allowed to be taken. So you actually leave with your treasure and something that's a vestige of this event, which would only happened for one day. 
So the commitment to in install essentially what was a museum show, the idea was that it was more important that people have this possibility, this story, and this sense of discovery than to have it be there forever. And it, em ephemerality of it was also part of the content. In other words, sometimes it's important to focus on the idea that your experience, your moment, your present day and, and uh, present interaction is more important than um, things being in perpetuity, things being there forever. Um, so that's the, that was the idea behind the island. I want to close by saying what we're really thinking about <clears throat> is what art has always been, uh, or at least been for a lot longer in its history than what we're familiar with now. It's only a very short time in its history that objects were a part of museums or private collections or residences, but really initially it was intended to be in fact, intended for uh, the real world to be a part of life in and of the world in which we live. So thank you very much.